Well, my lights are back on and I'm ready to go. But oh, now all the headlines have piled up on me and I've got tons of them to share with you. So stick with me, folks, and I'll be right back. Hey everybody, this is Deb with Toothification Chronicles and oh, we yeah, have the lights are back on and actually they were only out until about halfway through that night, but oh boy, it was <laughs> uh, quite a night and my parents' electricity was out even longer than that. Lots of stuff in the refrigerator went bad, so eh. Oh, well, had to take care of all that. So it just kind of put me down for a couple days and I wasn't able to really get back in the swing of everything. So now I've just got tons of these. I don't know how long this is going to last, so I better get going. Anyway, I wanted to share this website with you. Well, evidently, they are kind of offline for now because they're so full up. It's called rescam.org. And what it does, it's really very brilliant. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Rescam. That allows you to send phishing emails or scam emails that you get to this place. Then they have this AI respond to them and go back and forth with the scammers to tie up their time. And so this is kind of a brilliant thing. I recently found a guy on YouTube who does uh, scammers. I mean, he's a hacker that hacks the scammers. And it's just pretty brilliant to watch him work. He's so calm. He's from the UK and he just kind of calmly deals with these people. And, you know, he does send the information when he finds it and he sends it into the FBI and different places and he reports them. So they end up getting busted. But He's just brilliant in the way he does it. So I'll leave a link to one of his down below too while I'm putting in all the rest of these links. But he had this program. Evidently, they right now have too many of them, so they're kind of backlogged. But when this thing is up and running, what you do is you forward a scam email to them and then they just engage it. It's so you don't engage it at all and it ties them up and it ticks them off and it pretty much just kind of <laughs> uses their manpower in a way so that while they're dealing with this AI, they're not dealing with real people. So it's less people that they can scam. So although it's not going to take care of the problem, it's not going to report them, the, at least does that for us. And so, the, like I said, the other guy, he deals with like the phone call scammers and the people when you get pop-up boxes on your computer that say that you must call this tech company and then they charge you an arm and a leg to do something that they're not really doing. And while they're doing that, they're probably hacking into your computer. Needless to say, I'm just going to say one thing. Don't ever let somebody have remote access to your computer, ever, okay? Unless it's a person you know in person, do not ever let them. Whether they say they're a tech company, whether they say they're working for Microsoft, I don't care, doesn't matter, don't let them do it, okay? Just be safe. Anyway, so then I want to get into this because this was a really good interview with uh, that Mark Levin did of AG Bar, and... One of the things that he did was he accused the media of, of projecting a narrative. And when he was talking about things, he said they don't video parts of the stone throwing and all the violence. All they do is video the calm, peaceful parts. And that's why they want to say it's mostly peaceful. By the way, when they, somebody says, well, they're mostly peaceful, say, wait, get that word mostly. Check it out. If it means mostly peaceful, that means there is violence. Because you can't use the word mostly without some of it, at least a part of it, being violent. How much violence are you willing to accept? Okay, at what point do you draw the line at the violence? Is it 1%, 10%, 25%, 50%, 49%? .59%? That would be mostly peaceful. Still, 51% would be mostly peaceful. So if there's 49% violence and 51% peaceful, are you okay with that? So that's a good talking point, I thought, that he pointed out. Anyway, I'm going to play just a little bit of this. Talking about the media, you don't really get a fair break in the media, do you? Plus, plus, we have these citizen reporters who have these videos of these events, which are quite different than what we get a lot of times from the media, which seems to be sort of censoring the violence. No? Absolutely. They're, they're you know, they're narrative. They are projecting a narrative. When, when the word narrative came into currency, I, I knew we were in trouble because the word narrative really suggests that there's no objective truth. 
there's no real story of what happened. It's just everyone has their own narrative. And you get to then uh, the press can justify presenting a story that doesn't really correspond to objective truth, but it's our narrative. We have a narrative, you have a narrative. Uh, I've been appalled at what's on, on this violence because it's happening right out in the streets. Anyone with eyes can see what's happening. They see the violence. They see the, these groups of uh, agitators in their black outfits uh, and their he helmets and their shields, which incidentally have the, have the hammer and sickle on them most of the time. Uh, rushing the police, causing violence, throwing rocks, the people showing up with the rocks and the frozen bottles. That's happening. That's happening in front of people. You don't see it on any of the national news. You don't see it on the networks. You don't see it on the other cable stations. And yet you hear about these peaceful demonstrators. So it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's a lie. The American people are being told a lie by the media. So, yeah, the American people are being told a lie. The rest of this is really good. This is the, the clip about the media and so forth. Down here, he has another, they have another clip. And this is where he's talking about Antifa and everything. I think this clip was first, you know, as they started out the program. And then it went into this one up here later. But um, all I've seen are bits and pieces of it. I haven't seen the full clip from start to end. So anyway, I wanted to share this with you because I think this is a very important interview that you need to watch. And I'll have the link down below just like usual. Well, here we go. These are not in any great order because I've just got a lot of topics I'm going to be touching on. If you are somebody who doesn't have a whole lot of time, remember that you can always go down to the bottom, change the settings so that it you know goes faster speed to save yourself some time. I don't mind that. That's not insulting to me at all because we all have limited amounts of time and if you really are in a uh, rush you can always go down and look in the links and just scan the links to see if there's something in there that interests you and usually i put them fairly much in order so you should be able to kind of guess where in the program that it is i know youtube now lets us do the different um, segments but i'm telling you if i did it for this it would just take forever to do it so i'm just going to leave the links down below and you'll have to kind of guess and by golly all right, so California will soon be paying $1,250 to people who test positive for coronavirus. Wow, is that an incentive? Hmm, I wonder how many people are going to rush to get the test just so they can say they were positive and now get money. <sighs> yeah, I don't know that it'd be worth it, but there will be people who will do that. And it's uh, kind of sad, but they only have $10 million set aside for the program, so that will only take care of 7,500 people. Should be interesting, I don't know. I think it's to make it happen, you know, to make the numbers go higher. That's all I can think of. And yet they're gonna pay people because not enough people, I guess, are taking the test. I don't know. Anyway, I wanted to share this one with you too because this is one of Breitbart's editors and he has a book that just came out and it's called 50 Things They Don't Want You To Know About Trump. And they're really a good list. By the way, he's black. Just wanted to point that out because I thought that was pretty important there. And these are the things about Trump that the mainstream media is trying desperately to hide because they are so positive. You go through this and you see what they're saying here. These are very positive things about Trump. And this is what more people need to see. I don't know what the other 50, uh, the rest of the 50 are, but here we go. This is at least some of them because, uh, yeah, violent crime has fallen every year since Trump took office after rising the last two years under Obama. So, yeah, border crossings plummeted by 78% from March 2019 to March 2020. That's when the wall was getting put up. So, yeah, very good things here. This is a very interesting. Median household income reached 65,666. <laughs> okay, that's not so great. But anyway, the highest level on record, which is very good too. So I will leave the link to that one down below too, because I think it's a good article and just lots of things that we can put out there. And if you are a meme artist, those would be wonderful to put in a meme. So, or various memes. So those are important things that we need to know. And I don't know what the others are, but I'm sure they're good too. Well, this is from the Washington Examiner, and this was about 
uh, the Barr interview, here's another quote that he said. In fact, some things that were clearly preposterous, they took hook, line, and sinker. He's talking about the press. And they fanned the flames of this worse than anybody else, Barr said. They all got out on the limb. The limb has been sawed off, but you wouldn't know it because there's, you know, they they don't even say, whoops, we got that one wrong. They're on to the next conspiracy theory. And then they turn around and they accuse us of doing conspiracy theories. And it's like, Oh, just all the things that they want to say are conspiracy theories are suddenly coming out into the open and becoming true. And by the way, they're very upset that um, the Anons have taken over the hashtag Save the Children. That's been out there. And there's a lot of hit pieces on Mr. 17 lately. So uh, they're very upset at us. Judge rejects Ghislaine Maxwell's latest request to delay unsealing of explosive court docs after her legal team claimed they unearthed critical new information. So here's the document itself. If you want to read this, it came out on August 11th. And it basically, it's just, it's pretty short here. It just says that they had, um, her Maxwell's decision to request a stay based solely on vague allusions to critical new information illustrates her disregard for the court's time as well as her willingness to engage in dilatory conduct to thwart the unsealing process. So that's what she's trying to do. Any renewed request for a stay should be accompanied by a coherent explanation of how any new information she received via discovery in her criminal action justifies interfering with the unsealing process that the Second Circuit ordered over a year ago. So it's taken this long for it to get through. Now, the thing is, these documents can't all come out at once. They have to come out a little at a time just because when they go to unseal something if there is someone named in it like for instance the time that alan jerserwitz was named then they had to give him a chance to respond and to give a good reason why it should not be unsealed of course you know it has to be a really really good reason and if it's not which this judge seems to be saying eh, this is not a good enough reason so yeah it is not a good enough reason the court did reject it and they're going to unseal them anyway which is going to add to more people being pretty perturbed about it all so anyway thought i'd share that with you and then this um this was a thread by katherine harridge on flynn and I've got to tell you, I haven't heard the Flynn thing. I just, you know, it was all the mess that went on the last few days. So I haven't heard it, but she says here, most intriguing plus perhaps most significant revelation from today's oral arguments at appeals court in line of questioning with Judge Merrick Garland. And you remember who he is. He was Obama's choice that he wanted in to replace Scalia. Acting Solicitor General Jeffrey Wall revealed Attorney General Barr, who ultimately made the decision to drop the case. Now, Barr was the one who did make the decision to drop the case against Flynn. So that's one reason why the Democrats are coming after him so hard. Well, she goes on and she says, may have more information that has been made publicly available. And this is what I've you know, said all along. Barr knows more than what he can say. And he makes these decisions, but when he makes them, they have to be publicly available. And that means that anything classified or anything that is part of Durham's cases that he's building against these people, Barr can't talk about this. And there's a lot of the information and the reason that all this is happening and that Durham is taking it and you know running with it Barr can't say what Durham is finding he knows what Durham's finding but he can't talk about it and that's why the Democrats are trying to um, push that and say that's because he's making these decisions without sufficient information without sufficient evidence well that's not true the truth is he's got it he just can't show it to you right now because it's being used to build court cases and they can't be unsealed because that's kind of classified unsealed you know sealed type stuff so 
Wall claimed that under the circumstances, they went further than they were obligated to. And by the way, Judge Garland, just to drive that point home, we, the AG, of course, sees this in a context of non-public information from other investigations. Crosstalk Garland, uh, you know, because they do that, sometimes talk against each other. Wall continued, yes, I just wanted to make clear that it may be possible that the Attorney General had before him information he was not able to share with the court. So what we put in front of the court were the reasons that we could, but it may not be the whole picture available to the executive branch. Note, any non-public info likely tied to Durham probe and or U.S. Attorney Bash review of, of Flynn unmasking and whether it went beyond Flynn's case. This was music to my ears, this guy says, and that I was so with that too. It's like, wow, well, yeah, that's what it is right there. Again, I haven't heard the whole thing, but that gives a pretty good picture, I think, of that portion of it. And it's very encouraging because that means Durham is building cases. Because he's not doing a report, folks. I don't know why they keep saying that. He's not doing a report. That's not what U.S. attorneys do. They do prosecutions. And that's what he's working towards. This one, I don't know if you've heard this or not. I really think, you know, people need to be aware of this because this is a heartbreaking thing. George Floyd was a 46-year-old felon high on fentanyl, and he got four televised funerals and 70 days of riots. What does five-year-old Cannon Hinnett get? Do you know who Cannon Hinnett is? Yeah. Well, Cannon Hinnett is a little five-year-old who was killed. He was just shot, and I don't know, the, there was a picture before. I don't know where the picture is now. Because I had this a day ago, and here he is. So you can see, he was a little boy who was riding his bike around, you know, his, his home, and playing outside just like little boys do. The next-door neighbor, who had been to the family's house for dinner that night, as I understand it, just shot the boy on purpose and killed him and it, it, of course the neighbor was black and because of that probably is why they're not saying anything about it i don't know but it's not been on the news you probably haven't seen it and this is a gofundme that was done for the family i see that they have one hundred sixty thousand dollars now 4400 people just donated so um you know if you've got some money maybe that would be a good place to send some of it because this is really just discouraging to see this happen to a little child and they don't know why this man did it I mean he's been arrested obviously but they don't know why he did it and like I said he had been to the family's house for dinner the night before as I understand it and why this boy was just playing so I don't know um we live in a crazy world, but pray for the family of this little boy and make sure people know his name. And I think there's a hashtag out there, say his name, um, and his name's been trying, they've been trying to do a hashtag with it so we'll get it trending and more people will learn about it. So anyway, just breaks your heart when you have a story like this, but... You know, I don't care what color you are. If you shoot a little boy, that should be news. It shouldn't matter that you're one color or another. That's just appalling. Well, um, but censorship is everywhere, and this is an example of censorship. This one right here uh, was something that um, this Mike Davis was talking about censorship about this particular account and said what part of his tweet below is uh, fake and see that's what they said that it was violating our rules against posting misleading information about voting well look at this he said mail-in ballots in Colorado have pre-cut holes which reveal the red markings on Republican ba party ballots so um, this the pictures oh, I gotta go I hope I've got it on the next one yeah here okay so this was the guy that it happened to and he says wow when this post right here Mike Davis uh, started trending gained traction Twitter miraculously unlocked my account and why is that Jack didn't like being called out and then he mentions these other people that he has also tagged in it well and again I can't find the original pictures 
Um, but they were pictures of a ballot and the ballot had like a little hole on the back of it where you could see red stripes because the Republican ballots had red, a red bar along each side. And so it would be very easy for a postal worker who didn't like Republicans to just not deliver the red ones. Or once they were, you know, picking them up to be uh, sent along to where they were supposed to be counted, they could just make sure they never reached that destination. So that was what he was talking about here. And it was perfectly accurate. There was no reason for them to do that. But... There was someone in the comments on that particular one that was talking about this IAP. And the IAP is the Internet Accountability Project. And I thought this is kind of an interesting site here and especially deals with privacy, Section 230 and antitrust. And when you click on this Section 230, it will give you a good overview of why the Section 230 needs some type of modernization or there needs to be something done because of how it allows a lot of the big media um, companies to be able to censor things. I mean, they're not supposed to be able to censor things according to the 230, but they are. They are always able to censor something that is illegal, okay? Like, you know, the whole shouting fire in a crowded theater, you can't do that kind of thing. You can't incite to violence. Those things are for sure that they can censor. But they can't censor something like a picture of ballots just because they don't want people to see it. You can't censor that. And you shouldn't by Section 230. But right now, big companies are trying to play both sides of the street. They're trying to use the Section 230, which requires them, it, it makes them be a platform where they have very limited censorship abilities. And they're trying to be publishers, which means they get to censor what is posted on their site. And the reason for this is because, like for instance, YouTube or uh, Facebook or uh, Twitter, when somebody posts on there, and I agree with this part of it, because it is a forum, they shouldn't be liable for what that person says. I mean, you shouldn't be able to sue Twitter for something Joe Biden says or Joe Biden's handlers say. But, uh, you know, you shouldn't be able to sue the company that is providing the platform. And I agree with that. But if they're going to be censoring what can and can't be published, then they turn into a publisher. And at that point, then they should be held liable because they have chosen what can and can't be published. Yeah, so this is a, a really good statement, a good summary if you want to know what the deal is. I, I will leave this down below. I'll just give you a link to the 230 and if you want to go to the main page, you can go there. Okay, well, guess what? There are some WikiLeaks uh, emails that have to do with Maya Harris. Now, who is Maya Harris? Guess who she is? Yeah, she's uh, Kamala Harris's sister. So, and here's one. It, they were having a pizza party at Belmont, and Maya Harris is joining. How do you like that? So, actually, WikiLeaks has 137 documents on Kamala Harris herself. And, um, you know, then again, at least this one, I'm sorry, I had it set up so I could go back to the page that it, the notable that it was on. And, well, had to shut down the computer, of course, and I lost that. But I did keep this one, so I don't know exactly where the notable is on that, but... Anyway, so yeah, 137. So you can browse through those at your leisure. Um, I don't know what all's in them, but kind of interesting that there are that many of them about her. So I kind of agree with Trump that she really is probably the best person he could that Biden could have picked just because we'll be able to have so many things out there about her. We already have the video of her saying that the uh, people, what, 24 to 18 to 24 were stupid. Yeah. So if you're 18 to 24, she thinks you're stupid. Don't forget that because she said it. 
So I thought I'd share this with you, and I don't know what all's in there. I haven't had time to look, but I thought it was pretty interesting. The whole Kamala Harris thing, yeah, he had a script to read. If you haven't seen about that, he did have a script to read. He was holding his phone upside down. And if you haven't heard about that, you can just click this link and you'll find out. You know, he had a cheat sheet telling him what to say. It just, uh, yeah, too funny. Well, here it is. Okay, didn't know if I had this one or not. So, uh, yeah, there we go. And um, like I said, phone upside down. And, uh, you know, was he talking to her on the phone or was he talking to her on this? I just, I don't get why. So, um, anyway, but MSNBC did this to it so you wouldn't see. Look at this. They did that so you couldn't see that he had these notes, the script right here. And it was like not bullet points. It was the full script of what he had to say. It was so fake because you knew they had practiced it. I wonder how many times they had to shoot this. I don't know. But anyway, and then I wanted to show you this poll. If you are on, oh, this is the final votes. Okay. Well, when I came to this poll, the Trump and Pence was really down. And then all of a sudden the Patriots got it and boom, it goes up. So let's hope that is reflective of November. Um, be interesting to see. All right. Now, in case you didn't see this, this happened yesterday. I'm recording this on Thursday the 13th. And this is what happened. If you went to Antifa.com, it took you directly to Joe Biden's website. <laughs> somebody had hacked. I'm sure they had hacked into it and made it do that. But <laughs> yeah, this guy tells about it. He shows it on his phone. So if you want to actually see it, you can see it there. But um, yeah, so that's what happened. And of course, it's been fixed now because you go now and it looks like this. That's what you get. And then here, if you go to the who is about it, they've evidently had this uh, registered since uh, 2002 which is interesting. And um, somehow it was updated on June 20th. And then down here it says that it was, let's see, where is it? Last updated. Oh, down here in this. Um, I think it's the very last line. Yeah, last update of who is database on this was uh, 812. So not sure what happened, but, um, <laughs> and it says it's out of Panama. So I don't know what it is. It's, uh, was just funny. <laughs> so, oh, but you can still get my Antifa.com. Look at that. <laughs> if you want to buy it, there it is. Okay. So that was just a humorous little side thing. And then this video right here, it's not a real good copy of it. It, there's a lot of echoing and then they do a translation thing where this guy speaks in English and then it's uh, translated into Spanish. So it's about half as long as it really is, in other words. But essentially what this is was an organization, they got together and it was called Medicos por la Verdad, Doctors for the Truth. And what they were trying to get across is that this whole thing about the overreaction to COVID and how all of this is just damaging what's going on in our societies and not just in one country, but across the globe. And so these European doctors got together to stand against it because they were tired of the lies being spread and they know differently because they're on the front lines and people were not listening to them. A similar situation to what's happening here, you know, and I can't guarantee that this video is still going to be there when you get ready to watch it. It's about 13 minutes, I think, something like that. But again, about half as long, really, because you've got the Spanish translation in there. And the sound quality is not real great. But still, these doctors were saying, we know that what's being put out there is not right. We know that this is not as serious as they're making it out to be, that it's no worse than a flu. And they just pretty much go through and say that. And of course, you know about the frontline doctors that um, were censored and everything. And so these doctors are very concerned that they're being censored. You know, they're doctors. What makes them less of an expert than another doctor? So I think that it, 
we really need to hear both sides of the story. And unless we hear both sides and make our own decisions, it should be between someone and their doctor. That's what it should be. But, you know, things aren't always as they should be these days. There, uh, there's the WikiLeaks posts, 137 documents. Uh, hours after she is named Joe Biden's running mate. Oh, so they just posted um. Oh, I missed that part. Anyway, okay, this is the video right here. Here it is. Um, still there, evidently, at this point, And it's had 59,000 views. So I think this is a good one to share. And, you know, people just need to understand that it's not just here in the United States that doctors are being censored. It's across the world. And that should concern everyone. Because we all need health. And we all need health care. And if the people who are running the health care, the higher ups, are telling our doctors things that are not true, that should scare all of us. Because it's just dangerous to everyone in the world. Well, another piece of not so great uh, news, but this kid was having her Zoom class. You know, the child was in the middle of a Zoom class. And what happened? She was 10 years old. She was taking her first online class from home when her mother was shot dead in front of her. Can you imagine? And it was a trauma to everyone. I mean, the teacher shut off her mic, shut off the girl's mic as quick as she could. I don't know that the actual shooting was visible to the kids that were on there because there were other kids. Um, yeah, just such a sad thing. And what do you do? I mean, there are going to be some situations like that. And this is one reason why these kids need to be back in school. Because, okay, here's the situation. You've got kids that are not in school. That means they're home more, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But if they're in a bad home, then that means they have more time, more exposure to whoever the abuser is. And in this case, the child had a trauma that I, they'll never get over. That just would be horrible. And the other kids on the Zoom call probably are feeling the same way. It, it would be horrible for them as well. So I don't know how much they saw. I don't know any of that. It doesn't really say that much here. But I think that's something that we need to be aware of. Those kinds of things are happening. And when kids are going to classes on a regular basis, we have a better chance as teachers, we have a better chance of picking up on the abusive situations. Now, I am all for homeschooling if you can do that. But again, we need to be cautious of the type of homeschooling that's done in order to hide an abusive home. So we as a community need to be aware of that. And when you're around kids, even if they're not your kids, you're in the grocery store or you're at Walmart or wherever you're going or the park or whatever. If you see a, some kids, you know, just kind of make sure that you're not seeing any of the signs of abuse on them. You know, if they have bruises or, or something like that, just be aware. I'm not saying that kids don't get bruises, but you know, if they have something obvious, sometimes there's a reason for it. So we need to be very careful about that too. Again, I'm all for homeschooling, but I also know that sometimes abusers use that and the isolation of the kids to be able to um, inflict more harm on the child. So just be aware of that. This was not the case. I'm sure the girl would have normally been in school. And who knows, if she'd have been in school, maybe the mom could have um, gotten away. Maybe the mom wouldn't have been there. Maybe she'd have been at work. You don't know what the situation was. So I just think that we need to get the kids back to school so we can maybe de-escalate some of these situations. Because you know people are drinking more. Alcohol sales have, you know, skyrocketed. So if people are out of work and they are drinking, that can also set up an environment for a child to be in more danger too, if it's an abusive household. So again, another reason they need to be back in school, in my opinion, or at least being homeschooled by somebody who's a good parent. All right. So uh, this I thought was interesting. Brazilian patriots declared, and this was yesterday, I believe, um, here. 
yeah, the 12th, August 12th, Brazilian patriots have declared today as the International Day Against George Soros. <laughs> They've launched a website here, Stop Globalism, and the hashtag Stop Soros is already number two in Brazil. <laughs> so I think that's pretty good. I wanted to let you see that. Um, you know, people know about George Soros, and it's not just our country that he's caused problems in. He's causing problems in a lot of countries. And I can't help but wonder how much of Kamala Harris's money uh, that has that has and will go into her campaign comes from him. But if you check the FEC, they don't have him as giving very much at all to the DNC. And I think that's probably because he's found other ways to get the money to them you know, back channels. I just wanted to point this out to you because this Marjorie Taylor Greene has won this um, primary and she's going to be hopefully elected because she's from a very uh, Republican area. So I don't know. And they're all upset because she is a supporter of number 17. And they've been putting this scene. This is what the New York Times said. They even called her a QAnon supporter there. So I thought that was very interesting. Uh, yeah, there's been a big targeting. And I'm kind of surprised here that Carter Page put it down there. But then again, I'm not surprised because of all people, I'm sure Carter Page has seen a lot more things out of number 17's posts that are um, accurate and he knows they're accurate because he's been in the middle of things. So he understands and he knows. So I think that's really great. Well, the last thing I have for you is this. And we have President Trump's executive orders last week. Here's just a list of them. This is a really good post that just shows what things these executive orders did. President Trump made the vaccines voluntary, not mandatory. Military will check purity and distribute the vaccines. He defunded the WHO forever and wants an investigation into its operations. He canceled the Democrats' H.R. 6666 bill. You knew that one was bad just from the number. Known as the COVID Trace Act, that was the basis for Bill Gates' diagnosis and tracking project, which was also canceled. Canceled Bill Gates' project known as ID2020 opened a complaint form to report censorship on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. It was overrun with complaints. They got the evidence. I didn't know that he had one open, but I guess they they did earlier. I know they did a few months ago, but this was a new one, evidently. Executive order to reopen states. Governors who refuse to reopen will be sued. Executive order for White House to take over all electrical grids, which will include internet servers, broadcasting systems, electronic systems, declared places of worship, essential services. Some mayors are fining people for going to church. Applauded Australia and 116 countries for insisting on a China probe into the spread of COVID-19, despite several threats from China about refusing critical exports. Arrested and dismantled sex human trafficking rings in several countries. So a lot has been going on and just wanted to share those with you. There's the pen. And it's just kind of funny when you start looking at Obama's executive orders. The difference was Obama's were to push through policy items that he wanted done, but the Republicans wouldn't pass in Congress. But these things right here. These are things that are for the American people, the good of the American people. And when he signed the ones that are going to be, you know, giving the extra money to people, uh, you know, the uh, unemployment, when he signed the one that's going to cut the taxes out. And can you imagine if your paycheck doesn't have those taxes taken out? If you get a regular paycheck, you're going to appreciate that one big time. And if he's reelected, then he's going to just abolish that. And the Democrats are trying to say that that's going to abolish Social Security. It's not. OK, there's money for it. There will be money for the Social Security, because if you start looking at the numbers for the government, not that much money is actually raised from taking the money out of our paychecks. OK, 
if you look at the grand total and when you're talking trillions, not that much of the operating budget comes from our support of the Social Security from our own paychecks. And that's something a lot of people don't understand. They think that's where the primary source of money for the government comes from. That's not at all. A lot of the government comes from taxes and especially like tariffs on imports and things like that. When we cut out all the money laundering that's been done by sending money to foreign countries and then having it put back into Democrat campaigns, yeah, it really does start to add up. And this is where Trump is going to succeed in a big way, especially once these businesses get going with a big boom, you know, after he's reelected, things are going to take off. And when that happens, then there's going to be a lot more taxes coming from businesses because that is where your big base is going to be. It's not from the Social Security tax that you and I pay. That's not really where the monies come from. There will be more monies and there's going to be a lot less spending because of all the travel and things. But I'm going to have a separate video on travel because I've been finding some things on that. So anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see y'all later.